Hello there, my name is Alex uh, on Instagram. I'm called Disorganized Film and I am a photographer. I've been taking photos now for about seven to eight years, mostly shooting on film. And uh, I mostly do street photography kind of stuff. Um, uh, but I've recently been delving more into landscape, street portraiture, normal portraiture, and even sometimes like fashion. And I wanted to make these videos as a sort of travel diary kind of thing. Um, and today we're gonna look at the first five days of my one month trip to Japan. Um, I arrived on the 27th of December and we're gonna go all the way up to the second. So uh, I'm gonna look at how we how I celebrated New Year, there's some street photography in Osaka, um, my trip to Kyoto. Um, but first, uh, let's look at some of the cameras that I brought. Um, so the first camera that I brought with me was the Nikon F2. Uh, and I brought some lenses with this camera. I have my 50 1.8, the Japanese version, a 28 mil 3.5, and a 70 to 210 F4. Um, the second camera that I brought with me isn't really a serious camera that I use, it's more of my fun day-to-day -day camera, kind of like a backup camera. It's the Fuji Class W, and this is a really, really fun little compact camera. Sometimes the focusing can be a bit slow, but um, I, I still love this camera nevertheless. The third camera I brought with me was the Hasselblad X-Pan um, with a 40mm lens, and this was actually really kindly loaned out to me by my friend Alex, Bright Lights and Dark Rooms on Instagram. Definitely give him a follow, he's a great photographer. Now the fourth camera is the Fuji GS 645S. Now this is my go-to landscape camera uh, because it has a slightly wider 60mm f4 lens. I also use it for street work sometimes, but I really, really like this camera. Uh, I think this is one of the best travel film cameras out there, really. Uh, I can't think of another camera that is so lightweight and can operate manually without a battery. I mean, even the Mamiya 7 can't do that. The one thing about this camera though is that it has been through the wars a bit. Uh, the viewfinder at the front, the panel, actually did fall off at one point and I had to super glue it back on. The flash capability in the grip is also kaput, but uh, I still use the cold shoe for my light meter and the grip, well, as a grip. And the last camera that I brought with me was the Rolleiflex 3.5 MX with a Tessar lens. Now this is probably one of my favorite cameras uh, and I brought this to do everything from street photography, street portraits, and landscape stuff. And you'll see this camera a lot, uh, it's banging. So yeah, um, that is the gear that I brought with me. Oh, um, I also used uh, two light meters, a Sekonic Flashmate and a Voigtlander VC Meter 2. Um, I use these a lot. I have the VC meter mounted onto the cameras uh, and I used the Sekonic mostly for the Rolleiflex. So the first place I went to in Osaka was of course the famous Dotonbori Street and I took my X-Pan with me and walked along and tried to do some photography. It was more of a kind of warm-up session. But uh, yeah, here we go. So I know this photo is hot trash, but it was also the first photo of the day. What can you do? I actually kind of like this one, although it's a shame it's not centered. So a little bit about Dorombori, it's pretty much the Times Square of Osaka. It's really colorful with its many signs and massive figures advertising each shop. It's been around since the late 1500s after a merchant Yasui Doton was rewarded with this land after serving the big dude at the time, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who was like the warlord. Doton, the name of the merchant, and Bori, which is derived from Hori, which means canal. Dorombori, history. Especially famous is one billboard called the Glico Man. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm not quite sure why. I think it has just become the symbol of the street. In reality, Dorombori is just a really busy street with many food and souvenir shops and cool advertising. One thing I forgot to mention is the film I was shooting. This was actually my first and last roll of Kodak Gold that I shot in Japan. I only brought one and Kodak is hella more expensive in Japan. Okay, so this one's all right. I like it. It's a little unbalanced at the sides, but that's one of the struggles with shooting a panoramic camera, right? So that was Dodonbori Street. I know it wasn't much. Uh, we're definitely gonna revisit this area again in a later episode, so don't worry. 
So the next day, we decided to go to Kyoto, and the first place we went to was the Nishiki Market. Now this market is really famous for its street food, and you get a lot of similar markets in Japan, but this one is really, really long and very popular and very busy. It was actually probably too busy for shooting like this, I really struggled and so did filming it because you can see it's really shaky. Sorry for that. Okay, so mini film review. These were all shot with Fuji 100, a film stock discontinued everywhere but Japan. Some of you may know this film as it actually used to be called Fuji Industrial 100. So if you're in Japan, definitely try some out. And it's only 1,650 yen a roll. That's about £8.65. That's really cheap. And it handles surprisingly well. It's a lot grainier than most 100 ISO films, so it's no ektar, but it's pretty much on par with most, I would say, 400 ISO films. I personally rate it higher than Kodak Gold. I think it handles contrast really well, and for its price, it has pretty decent dynamic range. It does, however, prefer greens, just like most Fuji films, but not nearly as much as Extra or Superior did. It's not so garish. This is like the cheap man's Pro 400H, and man, I loved that film. So I shoot Fuji 100 when I can, I don't mind the grain. So this is what I would call the first banger. I really like this shot, the color, the saturation, the contrast. My eye can really wander around this photo. Perhaps the only thing that could be better is if his right hand was in the shot, but a photo is hardly ever perfect, so I'm happy. So I had no idea at first what these were for, but I found out a couple weeks later and it's really, really cool, but I'm gonna leave that for another episode. This market has also been around for a really, really long time, as early as the 700s. Walking through it, there is no sign of its age though, as like most places in Japan, it's been entirely rebuilt and modernized many, many times. The first time you walk through these types of narrow markets are really, really cool. Having such open kitchens and seeing them cooking right in front of you just really makes you feel part of that Japanese buzzy magic. It also attracts my camera far too much and I definitely finished a roll here. So of course, coming to a food market, you have to try some food, right? And I decided to get some charred octopus skewers and a grilled rice ball. That may sound really simple, but most of the food in these markets are. And even simple, they still taste great. Definitely good drinking food, quite salty. At the end of the market stands the Nishiki Tenmangu Shrine. It is dedicated to Tenjong, the god of scholarship. So you'll see loads and loads of students praying around this near their exam time. Now this stone cow represents the divine messenger for the deity, and to improve your luck you're told to pet it. Now apparently petting its belly is for pregnancy, and its head for headache prevention. Now for those that don't know, the way to pray at a shrine in Japan is to put a coin in the box at the front, ring the bell, bow twice, clap your hands twice, pray and make your wish, and then bow again. There are then these little fortune boxes that you can get your fortune told at, and it's, you know, it's really fun actually. Now in a lot of shrines you will see these little springs, and most are not safe to actually drink from, but apparently this one is. People actually bottle this water and take it home with them. 
Now by far the most famous part of Kyoto is the Kamo River, and running parallel with this is Pontocho Alley, known as the most beautiful street in the city for its very traditional style. So one of the great things about Pontocho Alley is sometimes you can get to see a geisha. I didn't see any this day, but I did see one last year, but unfortunately my settings were wrong, so it's slightly underexposed. I also took one of my favorite photos here last time. It was this little water feature with fish in it, and I just had to take it again. My personal favorite part of Kyoto are these turtle-shaped stepping stones. This area of the river is really peaceful. You'll see many people relaxing and some even playing instruments. I think this was probably my best photo of the day. I like the story it tells, with the kid about to dip his foot in the water, the guy on the left looking sullen, the little girl about to jump to the next stone. I think it's really cool, and it has a nice composition too. So that was Kyoto. The next day was the 31st and we headed to Shiga as for New Year's we were going to witness the fire festival called the Oni Oishiki Ceremony. <laughs> few notes on what happened. We had to drive up to the top of this mountain to where this temple was and it was unbelievably cold and unfortunately raining as well. To make things worse I only had around a roll and a half of film on me and not too much battery left on my camera. Well filming this event I hadn't noticed but the focus switch at the front of the camera had been knocked to manual as so easily it does. Thanks for that wonderful piece of design Fuji. So unfortunately, a lot of these shots are out of focus. The ceremony itself is about banishing the demons that represent all of the bad doings from the previous year to create a sort of clean slate for the next year. And this is done by this kind of warrior monk fighting and battling the ogre demons and kind of destroying them.
Unfortunately, this is where my camera died. So I didn't get to film the New Year countdown, but we spent it having daikon soup by the fire. The next day, the 1st of January, I went to take photos of the sunset by Lake Biwa in Shiga, but it didn't go quite to plan.
Hi again. Okay, so I know that was a bit of a weird, sad kind of ending, but um, you know, the event happened, it was real, and I didn't quite know how to approach it, so I just thought I'd go the serious route. Um, I promise not all the videos are going to end so sad. Um, next episode is going to be really fun. Uh, it's all about Hokkaido. So, uh, hope to see you again soon, and uh, thank you for watching. <laughs>